Today we've got uh, uh, representatives from the Disney State Board of Architectural and Engineering Examiners. And uh, we've got uh, John Cothran, who is the Executive Director. Is that right? And then we've got board members. Laura Reinfeld. Laura Reinfeld and Helbo Balthrop. Balthrop, yep. So give them a warm welcome, and they're going to talk to us about licensing. Okay, good afternoon. I guess it's afternoon, so hope everyone's doing well. And I understand that you have a required number of these sessions to attend. And if you're here, it's either you're running out of time or you really wanted to come to this particular topic. But we're glad you're here today. Uh, my name is Hal Balthrop. I am a PE, a professional engineer, not physical education. You, you might have to tell your friends that as, as they become aware of what you're going to do in life. Uh, I am an environmental uh, civil engineer. I work at the water department, actually. I used to be in private practice, but now I work in the public sector for the water department. I'm Laura Reinbold. I'm the associate engineer on the licensing board. I'm a PE. I am um, then the geoprofessional, so congratulations to y'all who the geoprofessional, geotechnical, um, a firm called TTL. And, yeah. <laughs> Sinjin, yes. Sinjin is one of our interns. Hey. Um, and so, uh, the kind of a sort of a subspecialty of civil engineering, um, and uh, I'm on the business side of things these days, but I've been in the profession for about 30 plus years. And I am John Cothran, the board's executive director. I'm not a PE, I'm not an architect, I'm just a regular guy. That's what I like to tell people. Um, I'm the, just the administrator of the board. I've been with the state about 16 years, been director for eight, I believe, of the A&E board. So it's, it's a good group to work with, I will say that. He keeps us in line. So our board represents, or we at actually uh, are responsible for, I guess, uh, engineers that are licensed in the state of Tennessee, architects that are licensed in the state of Tennessee, uh, landscape architects in Tennessee, and uh, interior designers, believe it or not. So we have quite a diverse uh, board. Uh, a lot of state boards actually have engineering and surveying together, and you notice that you'll see some literature from NCWS. How many of you know what NCWS stands for in this age of acronyms? Anybody familiar? It's the National Council of Examiners of Engineering and Surveying, actually. So a lot of states have engineering and surveys together on the board. In Tennessee, we do not. Surveyors have their own board. Um, how many of you, let me just see how many, so we can kind of tailor some of our comments. How many are in the mechanical department here? Ooh, a big majority. Okay. That's, that's, that's a good discipline. And a lot of schools, a lot of schools, uh, Mechanical departments are one of their larger departments. How many are in the civil department? Okay. And how many are in electrical computer? Okay, be nice to these guys, everybody, because if, if they don't want you to succeed, they can mess up your computers and your electronic devices, right? So there's an old joke that uh, mechanical engineers design weapons and civil engineers design targets, right? Have you heard that before? So think about that. Okay, so let's get on with the show. And this is a very relaxed presentation, discussion, so if you have any questions or think of anything during the course of the discussion, please feel free to ask. Raise your hand and ask or blurt it out. As long as you're respectful, please. No spitwads. So your future, and I, I, let me do another cross-sectional question here. How many are seniors? Okay. How many are, or let's go backwards, juniors, all right, and sophomores, and freshmen? Ooh, kind of split, I mean, kind of evenly distributed, I would say. How many have sat for the FE already, or scheduled their appointment? How many know what the FE is? <laughs> they all know what the FE is. Good. Yeah, I hope they do. Good, I, I figured they did, I just want to make sure. So, in terms of your future, you're already accomplishing a portion of what you need to do to become licensed. You're attending an ABET accredited university. And we're, we'll throw out these little questions to you throughout. Do you know what ABET stands for? Anybody? I'm hearing the mumbling. You're, you're right on. Basically, what do you want to say? Go ahead. 
That's correct. So that group, and you're familiar because you just went through some accreditation, uh, I think, reviews. Congratulations. That's a group that comes in. They're, they're actually visiting professors from other programs that's part of the committee that come in and look at your curriculum and some of the other criteria to establish your accreditation through that organization. And it's just a standardizing uh, entity for accredited engineering and technology programs across the United States. And actually they're international as well. So what does that mean, again, back to your future? Uh, you're, you're already accomplishing what we consider a three-legged stool for, towards licensure, which uh, uh, education's one, and then we're going to talk about exam and experience in the coming slides. So in your particular curriculum, um, you're focusing on some gen ed stuff, I'm sure. You have some general ed stuff, but also you're starting, depending on what year you are uh, in, some of your technical courses, right? So the technical courses are what's going to prepare you to practice uh, for your future. Uh, and, and you need to pay close attention to all classes, especially the technical. But I will say, and, and Laura and John can speak to this too, I hire engineers in my capacity and my, with my employer. And one of the important things that I look for in interviewing someone for a job in general, but more particularly in engineering, is if they have good communication skills. Can they look me in the eye when they speak to me or do they look down at their shoes when they're talking to me? Do they, are they welcoming? Do they feel confident in themselves? Um, because whether you go into public or private sector work, you're gonna have to communicate your ideas to a client or a stakeholder that you're gonna be dealing with. And many times people that have technical um, talent don't always have the ability to communicate or write very well. So I want to encourage you to take or put yourself in a position as often as you can to stand up in front of a group and talk or write a report that you might have to present or to give to someone because that practice as well as your technical courses are going to help you in whatever you do in the future. Do you want to add anything to? Uh, oh, amen, amen. I mean, okay. It, it just gets you good. Amen. Okay. Um, it, it gets the door open. I think Sinjin can tell you that, that we um, have a, at TTL, we have a group that, that is, uh, we're doer sellers. We go out and, and build our client relationships. That's a huge thing for consultants. So yes. having that technical expertise is assumed. Having that uh, personality that I know you all have that can, that can uh, uh, help consult and, and guide your clients is a huge, huge benefit. So. It is, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, and not to sound arrogant, but being in an engineering program, you're likely in the upper percentage of intelligence in the, uh, across humanity anyway. And again, there are other industries. I'm, again, that's not an arrogant statement, but I'm hoping you're finding that you're being challenged in the curriculum that you're taking and not everybody can do what we do. But there are other industries that are equally as challenging intellectually or artistically or, or, or whatever. And I think the thing that engineers have to keep in mind is that they are smart, but you don't want to lord that intelligence over on other people because part of the charge for engineers is to improve the quality of life for our fellow man, right? So you do that in a giving way and not in a, you know, overruling way. So again, that's some, some insights on, on your future. Also, typically when you're in your 20s, uh, or maybe some people in here in their 30s, but more so in your 20s, you don't really think too far in advance. You don't, you kind of want to just get out of school or get through that next exam or get through that next relationship, either beginning or ending, and you're not thinking about your future. Um, but part of what you're doing, again, the education is going to go into the exam period. Um, getting the FE behind you is going to be the next major milestone for you in your career as an engineer. When the economy had a downturn in 2008 time frame, many of you were probably still in high school, but it may have affected you too. It affected most everyone in this country and even around the world. What we on the board started finding though were people that were my age in their 40s and 50s that for whatever reason had been released from their employment because of the downturn of the economy. Many of those individuals were in industry or in practice that did not require a license. And so 
We had many applications during that time of candidates that were, again, in their 40s and 50s, had never taken the FE, or if they had taken the FE, had never taken the PE exam because they didn't think they needed it. Well, they found out when they were unemployed to market themselves and to set themselves above other candidates, they needed that license. And I will tell you, as an older person, <laughs> It would be hard for me to think about trying to sit and relearn information to, to take a PE exam. I'm not saying I can't do it and that others can't do it, but you're at the prime of your life in terms of you're kind of mentally conditioned <coughs> to take standardized tests. And I'm sure many of you took the ACT or SAT, and many of you probably took it multiple times. And you understand through that experience that sometimes it's, it's knowing the content of the exam and the depth of the content, but you also kind of have to condition yourselves to take and work through quickly but thoroughly those kinds of tests. So anyway, we had a lot of applicants that for whatever reason did not take the exams when they were availed the opportunity as early as they can. And part of our message as a board is to encourage you to sit for these exams as soon as you can. Because again, it's, for the information's fresher in your mind, and also your conditioning for taking an exam of that nature is, is now. Because when you get out, you're gonna likely start a relationship, you may get married, you may have children, and life gets a little busier. And you can ask your professors or anybody, ask your parents or anybody else, they'll tell you it gets busier and busier, so it's harder to do. So you need to think about what you're gonna be doing in five years, where do you want to be 10 and 20 years? Because everyone should think about those things, but you, you need to think about that, that as well in terms of your career. Next. So, I don't know that I'll speak on, well, I will mention competence. One of the things about licensure, and there'll be other slides on this as well, um, if you ever seek the services of a medical care provider, a doctor, for instance, are, first of all, they can't practice without a license, but would, will you seek for yourself or any family member any medical service through someone that wasn't board certified or licensed? Probably not, right? The same applies to accounting, for instance. So accountants have a CPA, and typically they're qualified for preparing business uh, budgets and your taxes and that kind of thing and by virtue of that designation when you do a tax return prepared by a CPA or any financial documentation prepared by a CPA there's less suspicion that it's not done according to standard or or ethics right are there any lawyers in the room or anyone with family that have lawyers okay there's one Law, law is another profession that requires licensure or certification to practice. So one might question, again, with all due respect, some people think lawyers are not very ethical sometimes, but they do have, just as we do on the board, they have a group that they have to account to if they malpractice. So again, you wouldn't go to an attorney if they weren't on the, a member of the bar in whatever state that you're in because their services would not avail you access to everything you should have access to as a client. So the same thing applies to engineering. Oh, Hal, I just wanted to point out, um, keep in mind, if you entered the engineering profession, say, 50, 60, 70 years ago, you would probably work for one em employer for the majority of your career, sure. right? That's not true anymore, we all know this. When you enter, um, the profession, you're likely going to work for multiple employers over the course of your careers. And thus, um, it's, it's, it's very important and critical to you to obtain this professional, this professional standing that comes with having a PE license because that's really going to set you apart. That's going to demonstrate that you have the knowledge, the skills, the experience to competently practice engineering to the public and to potential employers. Um, so I just wanted to make, reinforce that, how, how important it is to plan ahead, realizing that you may have to change jobs multiple times in your careers. And that's a valid point. And, and mechanicals particularly, <laughs> and chemical engineers, and even electrical at times, they'll go to work for an employer that in some states uh, qualify as being under an industrial exemption. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, 
but basically it is a, uh, an allowance for people that have engineering degrees to practice engineering as long as they're doing it for their, their uh, employer. Um, and so they don't have to have a license, they don't have to seal anything or stamp anything, they work for an employer. Well, again, back to my example of what happened in 2008 when the economy tanked, many of the applicants were in industry and that's why they didn't get their license. And also, and I, you, you hate to think this, but many times it's thought that employers like to indenture their engineers by discouraging licensure. So again, your license is something, as John's saying, you, you may work for multiple employers over the course of your career. You need this license to make yourself marketable and to demonstrate to the public that we serve that you've met the credentials to be considered a licensed professional. And keeping in mind also that laws do change over time, those industrial exemptions that exist in most state laws at this time could be eliminated could be. over time. I mean, it, it may be decades away, but it could happen certainly within the time span of your careers. True. So, Hal, is the point then that no matter where you go, whether it's into a situation where licensure is encouraged or into a situation maybe where it's not at the high list, you personally should, should very strongly consider licensure even if it's in a situation where it's not promoted? Exactly. Because you're licensing yourself. Exactly. You're, and, that's not the firm's license, anybody's license, right. but yours. Right. And it can, and, and mobility, if nothing else, it, it can serve you well. Yes. And it's, it's becoming more recognized internationally because many countries now use the same exams through NCWS. And actually getting licensed in the United States is considered a prestigious thing by many international engineers. So many will have a license or whatever their designation is in their home country, but they're also trying to practice and apply for a license comity in the United States. Again, your world is more competitive than it was when Laura and I graduated just because we're more international and you're gonna have to contend with that. It's not a bad thing. Competition's never a bad thing, but you just have to prepare yourself to meet those competitors. So what do hiring firms look for? I'll let Laura take that one. No, thanks, Al. Um, degrees, work references, and technical skills. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, now, the universe, what's the universe the, 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 uh, the PE license? Sorry, the PE Is the universal the standard, but the yes. PE license is the universal standard. OK, thank you. Um, that when you come to my office and you hand me a resume, if you've been practicing for 10 years, and for some reason you, you should have gotten your PE and you have not, that's a question I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask for that reason why you don't have a PE. And so in my, in my world, the world of, uh, that Hal and I work in, that's an assumption that we make. But if you've been given the um, opportunity, you've gone to an accredited school, you've taken the FE, and you have, or, or, or not, and you haven't gone after that PE, we're going to ask you why. Because that to us is a marketable piece of why we're going to be hiring you on. Um, and that universal standard of having the PE tells me when you come in the door that you've achieved those standards that have been set before you. It's hard for a reason. It's hard to get a PE. And as an employer, we know that. We know that it's not something you're just going to kind of trip through. You have, you've gone through those, those you've gone to this, um, School, you've gone to a school that's been AMED accredited. They, Lipscomb is wonderful in, to, in promoting the FE and, and helping you pass it. I think Lipscomb's passing rate is one of the highest in, in the state, so that's amazing. That's, that's mm -hmm. a wonderful situation. But if you come and, and we don't see that accomplishment, that's going to be kind of a basic thing that we're going to have to have. Okay, good. This is yours. Go ahead. I'll, I'll take this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, engineering licensure is, according to U.S. News and World Report, is crucial for career advancement and top pay. And, and as Hal's already mentioned, you think about other um, professions such as the medical professions, accounting, legal profession, and we, we could certainly add others to that list. 
Um, we value licensure in those professions because what they do impacts the public's health, safety, and welfare in the same way that engineering does or architecture. We could list other design professions there. And it's important that you have those qualifications and it represents um, that you're competent to the public. And this has been recognized for many years. You see here just a, a brief summary of the history of engineering licensure in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. Agricultural, industrial, and public works were becoming more complex. Um, it was increasingly um, recognized that there needed to be some type of regulation of the design professions, such as engineering. And 1907 was the first state that um, enacted an engineering registration law. 1907, Wyoming was the first to do that. And other states followed by 1950, every state in the U.S. Um, had an in engineering registration law. Um, several states enacted them after engineering disasters, such as the New London School disaster in Texas in 1937. Um, that very year, the Texas legislature created the Texas Engineering Registration Board as well as their Architecture Registration Board to try to prevent such disasters. How did you? And that, well, that was an explosion. It was a natural gas explosion. And actually, after that, they started putting the smell in natural gas right. that you smell today. Right, and then also the St. Francis Dam disaster in 1928 um, led to the creation of the California Engineering Board the following year. Um, that was caused because I think they added um, additional height to the dam, um, which um, later in the construction phase, I believe, and the, the dam simply couldn't support the additional height, and it collapsed and killed, I think, 500 people mm -hmm. that year. So that was a major disaster. And we could certainly list other examples here. These are the two most well, notable. Before you get off the slide, this is when we talk to like middle school students or even just the general public that's not familiar with what engineers do, um, we, we talk about their day and how they started their day. So you think about just waking up in the morning and going through your natural routine. Everything that you do throughout the course of your day in your world has been touched by an engineer at some point. And you never think twice about coming into this building thinking, is the roof going to fall in? Or driving across a bridge, is it going to be, maybe we think about that. We hear about that, but honestly, we don't think about that. Is the water that I'm going to brush my teeth with or drink, should I be concerned that it's contaminated or going to be harmful to me? We can go through the whole thing, the electric switches. Am I confident that I'm not going to be electrocuted? These are things we don't think about, but we take for granted, again, because of engineering. And that's what these examples demonstrate, that you can't just have anyone do these kinds of projects that affect the public health and safety. It's engineering. All right, now we're going to watch a brief video about engineers talking about PE licensure. Bless you. As an employer looking at a uh, resume on a, sheet, on a table that has, you know, she's got two candidates side by side, and one's got a license and one doesn't, uh, the employer automatically knows that the person with the PE has already met a minimum uh, standard of education, experience, and qualifications set by his peers. It's, uh, it takes away one unknown for him. If I were interviewing a candidate for a job and they had their PE license, it would tell me two things. It would tell me that they are technically solid, and it would tell me that they are willing to put forth the extra effort in whatever job they're doing, be it their license or any other job they may do for me. Well, the biggest thing that motivated me was, to me, it's the overall, it's almost the finish line. It's the ultimate goal to me in, in engineering is to be a, become a professional engineer. It, it, it's something that I always kept in the back of my mind, kept me very driven on those levels because it's like stopping short if I didn't get there. And it's something that also, it provides a great deal of flexibility in your career as you go on, whether it's not with the same company or somewhere different. If I didn't take it, if I didn't pursue it, I think it really did limit me as a person. What I, I would tell someone that wasn't sure whether they would need their P or not is that, like I say, you never know what, what you are going to do. It's two little letters, but it just opens the door for you to do so much more. It can only help your career. It, it'll open doors for you. It'll make you a lot more marketable than someone who doesn't have a PE. So what are the standards that a PE has met? Well, they have, the, as Hal's already mentioned, they have the education, the experience, and the examination requirements um, that 
proves that they, they have the competence, they've demonstrated the competence to pra practice the profession. That does enable them to stand out and protect the public from incompetent or unethical practice. Now who oversees licensure? Um, that's left to the states. The U.S. Constitution delegates um, any powers that are not explicitly laid out in that document to the federal government to the states. It's under the state's jurisdiction. So, for example, in Tennessee, if you want to obtain a PE license, you have to apply to the state registration board, our board, in order to obtain that license. The requirements can differ um, from state to state, but not very much um, because we do have uh, NCEES, that's that long acronym Hal mentioned earlier, um, that establishes model laws and rules for states to follow. Now that's a model, not every state enacts those model laws and rules, but for the most part we're very similar from state to state. There's going to be some variation. Um, certainly if you meet the basic requirements that we're going to lay out here that are accepted in Tennessee, you can obtain a license in any other state. And that's what we call comedy licensure, when you have to transfer your PE license um, to another state in which you need to practice. And again, that's where NCWS is a big help. They have a records program, so after you get your first license, you can set up a record with them that documents all of your education, your experience, your examination. So if you need to get licensed elsewhere, you can just have your record transferred to that state, and it makes it a lot quicker and easier to get that license. And these are the basic requirements for licensure in Tennessee. We do require a four-year um, engineering degree that's either EAC, Engineering Accreditation Commission, um, ABET accredited, or a substantially equivalent degree. All of you are in ABET accredited programs, so you don't need to worry about the substantially equivalent part. But we do have a process to review those. Um, also, four years of experience um, under the supervision of a professional engineer. That's, that's key. The, the board does look for that. You need to seek employment in which you're going to be supervised by a PE. Yes, oh, question? That question is eight years. No, that's not correct. It's four in Tennessee. In Tennessee, but other states it's eight years? I'm not aware, I'm not aware of, of any that. I think what you may be thinking of is if um, some states, they will accept different types of degrees. Um, I think what you're thinking of is a related science degree. Some states have an allowance for that, and I think typically if it's related science, like say physics, for example, you would have, not engineering, you would have to have eight years experience, but that path is not allowed in Tennessee. Can I uh, do a yep. sidebar? Th this is important to understand. That's a great question because it's important to understand this is in Tennessee. So these rules are different in different states. So if you're planning to move somewhere else, you need to find out what those states' licensure rules are when you move there. All right. So generally for the purposes of transferring your licensure, does it require further testing if you want to move to the state or further? No, that's, uh, again, that's the beauty of having NCWS. The exams are, are national exams, so they'll be accepted in every state. Now, some states may have some additional examinations, like California has a seismic exam. But that's the exception, not So the does rule. Florida. Florida has an Florida. additional exam as well. Yeah, not many states do that. And on that point, Tennessee does not license by discipline. So when you get a PE, it doesn't designate whether you're mechanical, electrical, civil. You're just a professional engineer. Or engineer. There, is a, there are some states that do license by discipline, very few. But then also there's a structural engineering designation that exists and uh, in Tennessee, again, we don't designate by discipline, but we allow candidates to sit for the structural engineering exam in lieu of the professional engineer exam. The structural engineer exam is a 16 hour exam. Yeah, so. Yeah, we don't have a lot of candidates taking the structural exam. Most of them opt for the civil exam. Um, I just want to point out as well, examination, we do typically require both the fundamentals of engineering, the FE, and the principles and practice of engineering, the PE examinations. Now there is an exception for applicants that have 12 or more years of experience. They can bypass the FE exam and just take the PE. So if you've got that long established practice of 12 or more years, you don't have to take the FE, but Again, not, not too many applicants want to wait 12 years to, to buy, just to bypass the FE exam. I certainly wouldn't recommend that. Additionally, because 
Um, if you take that route, you may have difficulty obtaining registration in other states because not every state has that provision. So you may end up, even though you're thinking you're getting around the FE, you may still have to take it to get licensed in, in another state. Also, regarding the experience, we have provisions in our rules. If you have a master's degree or higher, that can count for one year of your experience. Um, also, if you have um, a year of experience through a cooperative education program at your, your school, that can count for a year of experience as well. So that, that would help reduce your experience. Well, on experience, one other thing. Um, when you graduate, you're, you're likely, you want to get a job, I'm sure. That's one reason you're here. Um, do part of your questioning when you talk to a potential employer is whether they have any PEs on staff. Because uh, that, if you get multiple offers, what I would recommend that you consider is that you go to a firm that actually have PEs on staff because you need to work under the tutelage or internship of a PE to get your experience for eligibility for the PE exam. And oftentimes, we see candidates come through that have in some engineering experience, but they don't have either a supervisor or a peer or someone that can attest to their experience as an engineering intern. So make sure you look at that when you're looking for potential employment. So what does having a PE license entitle you to do? Again, there's some variation from state to state. Um, this is very Tennessee specific. Um, but for this holds true for pretty much every state. Only a PE can offer or provide engineering services to the public. Um, there are some exemptions, like Hal mentioned, if you're only offering services to your employer in industry, uh, that would be one exemption. But certainly if you offer those services to the general public, um, you need to be a PE. Um, that includes consulting work, signing or sealing a design, advertising engineering services, or making public use of the title engineer. That, that comes as a surprise to some people. They think, hey, if I've got an engineering degree, I can go out and call myself an engineer, put it on my, my LinkedIn account, my business cards, my letters that I, I send out. Um, and actually, in, in Tennessee, that's, that's prohibited by law unless you are a registered PE with the state, um, if you use that title in a public manner. And here's some benefits of a PE. Hal or Laura, you want to take this one? Well, we talked a little bit about it opens career doors, and that's certainly true. I know in my situation, I actually um, got my PE, pra after I got my PE, I practiced a little while, but then I um, was out of the corporate market for a, num a few years. And when I came back, the fact that I had my PE, that I'd achieved that accomplishment, that, that attainment, was much, uh, made it infinitely easier for me to get back into the, the corporate world. So it does open career doors. Um, your, your resume stands out. You belong to a licensed profession. I'm not sure we've touched on that as much as I really would like to. The, the pride of being a PE. I mean, we, we are a, a profession that has um, standards that require you to get to, to, do, to obtain licensure, to, um, to call yourselves an engineer. And that's important. Until I was um, appointed to the board, I don't think I took that as, as um, strongly as a, as a real, with pride, with the pride that I should have. And I do now. I use PE after, after everything, as should anybody who attains that. And I think you need to understand that there is an engineering creed that, that Hal and I got to look at yesterday when we handed out licenses, new licenses to, to new PEs. And that's something that uh, you should take very seriously. And you're held to a higher standard mm -hmm. as a PE because the, I, I don't, we don't like to mention this. Typically, we don't want to scare anybody, but you can be disciplined by the board if you violate our rules of professional conduct. So you are held to a higher standard um, than someone who's not registered. And that's maybe kind of a scary thing, but it's a good thing too because it does help you to stand out. The public knows you're accountable to a registration board, and that makes a difference. I'll give a good example. I was at lunch the other day with a client, and they're a big contracting firm, I mean an international construction firm. And we're doing a, a, a great project with them here in Nashville. But we wanted to introduce them to our construction materials testing manager. And um, typically, in some firms, that's not necessarily a PE. But when I mentioned that it is very important to us, two years ago, we made, when we were looking for a new CMT manager, that we wanted to have a PE in that position 
I could see them light up, and that was they understood why that was important to me um, to to have someone in that position, and that meant something to them. Just just those initials PE was very important. Um, open doors to management positions—that's definitely true. Um, it's a it's a credibility thing that that lets, lets people know that you're you're ready to, to take on more responsibility. You earn more than peers without a PE. In my firm, we give salary increases with uh, the attainment. And I assume most, if, if you're in a firm and they don't, you need to ask for it. And tell them I told you that. It, it deserves it. Um, they typically are going to be able to earn more for you. Um, that's how we make money as consultants, is we make money by um, being able to, to charge for what our, our employees do, and we can earn more revenue uh, when we're charging for a PE. Um, Provides flexibility as the work environment changes. I'm not sure what that means. Well, it goes back to your point of mobility. Yes. Again, with us be, being an international industry, it will avail you opportunity to move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And again, it goes back to the comity, which is the term that, it, some people use the term reciprocity, but reciprocity doesn't really apply in this, in this context. Comity is the appropriate. But if they know you meet minimum standards in one jurisdiction, they're likely to accept you in theirs as well. I'm going to add one that's not on this list. I don't know, maybe on a different one. But I'm on a uh, board of directors of an international business association. And they're often, if you don't have a PE and you're on an association, um, in, in leadership in an association, you can't get to that point without showing your credentials. And that's one of them. So I know that's, that's often. Well, we do have another video at this point about the responsibilities of the PE. I think we're going to skip that in the interest of time. If that's all right with you. To be a professional. It is. But let's get to the three steps to become a PE. Um, again, as, as we've kind of already outlined with you, you've got the education, um, the FE exam, you've got your experience, and you also have the PE exam. So I wanted to get into a few more specifics on that. Um, you do have to get a bachelor's degree in engineering from an accredited program. Of course, Lipscomb has three of those accredited programs um, at this institution. Um, and that those are accredited by the Engineering Accreditation Commission. So you've already completed step one. Well, you will have completed step one once you obtain your degree here. Um, also experience, work under the supervision of a PE, four years of progressive experience, and we throw that term around a lot, progressive engineering experience. I don't think everybody realizes what that means. Um, any guesses? What does that mean, progressive? Yes. Increase in workload. Yeah, or increased responsibility, right, exactly. Increased workload responsibilities throughout your, your time uh, 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 during which you're obtaining your experience. So that, that's what we mean by that. And I will mention, um, right now, you do have to have the four years by the date of the exam in order to sit for the PE exam. There is a proposal under consideration that might allow applicants to take the exam after they've graduated and passed the FE before they've completed their four years of experience. That's being discussed. Um, the NCEES model law has been amended to allow that pathway. Um, those that want to take the test early, but statistics do show that um, there are a few states that currently allow it. Statistics show that um, candidates usually do better with four years of experience. Am I correct, Hal? I think that's I think what we've that's seen. So far, yeah, yeah. It's kind of early in that allowance, but. Yeah. So far, we've gotten a lot of negative feedback about that proposal, but we'll, we'll see how it progresses in Tennessee. But there are several states that have recently implemented that. Most I don't close know if, to us is Kentucky and South Carolina. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention that because we don't want to encourage them to go out of state. <laughs> but yes, there, well, Kentucky, if you go up north, you can take the PE exam before you've completed the four years experience. And, and I'll share with you, in my personal experience, I have three children. They're all three engineers. Uh, uh, one is a professor at a university, and she is not eligible by virtue of that profession to sit for the PE exam in Tennessee yet. Uh, so she lives in Chattanooga. I've encouraged her to go to South Carolina and take the exam. And I would tell anyone, this is uh, not the board's opinion, this is a parent <laughs> of engineering children, I would take the PE exam as soon as I could take it. If I was starting at the point where you are. So you need to consider that. 
but just keep job. in mind you, you don't actually get your license no. until you've complete meet it, met the experience requirements. That's correct. So, that yeah, is correct. You may pass the P exam and have to wait a couple more years yes. or however long before you actually get your license. And there is some concern about how this could affect comity if you have to go to other states to obtain a license. There's some concern that some states might require you to retake the exam um, after you've obtained four years experience. So we're not, we don't understand all the ramifications of it yet. That's why we haven't adopted it in Tennessee to date. And these are some guidelines um, on how we define progressive engineering experience that you do need some experience in all four of these categories. Um, practical application of theory, engineering management, communication skills and social implications of engineering. And those um, requirements are outlined in some brochures we have on the front table up here about engineer intern certification. It goes into greater detail about what the board looks for when they review experience that's submitted by PE exam applicants. It's on our website too. Yeah, it is on our website. And I, can I say the board looks very carefully at each application. Four years is not just four years. By, you know, that experience has to be documented and really does have to fall into the required categories. And you have to show that experience. So it's very important to, to understand that going in. And of course we have the exams, the fundamentals of engineering, which we hope everyone will take in your senior year because the pass rates um, drop dramatically. Um, the longer you wait to take the FE exam, it's best to take it your senior year or shortly after graduation and of course pass the PE exam in your engineering discipline. When does Lipscomb allow you to sit for it? We usually do it in the spring. Okay. okay. Uh, so if we've got a December grad, we group them with the spring as well. Okay. So What's your current passing rate on the day? It's cumulative pass rate since our very first graduation in It's excellent. I mean, it, it really is excellent. And it's a testament to, to what you Congratulations. Well, here's some additional details on the FE exam. We're rapidly running out of time, I'm sorry to say, but we'll have to run through these last slides pretty quickly. Of course, the FE largely covers academic material that you cover in college. Um, it is now computer-based. It started January of this year, so you actually go to a Pearson View test center to take the exam. You still have to apply with us um, in order to, to sit for the schedule your exam, but you go to the NCWS website after you've been approved to sit and register there and take it at a Pearson View test center. There are two test centers here in Nashville. There's one in Brentwood and one out at Metro Center, I think, in downtown Nashville where you can take that test. And here's some information about the format and content. Um, a big change was it's now seven freestanding discipline-specific exams. And you have the disciplines listed there. There is an other disciplines module if um, yours is not, not covered there. Um, and they so do have, I'm sorry, how? Six, six yes. hour exam. Right, now, six too. hours. The actual exam time is five hours, 20 minutes. Okay. But the total time at the test center is about six hours if you need that long to complete the exam. You used to could have up to eight hours, but no longer. When it was a written test, twice a year. Yeah, now, but now it's, it's a big advantage because it is offered in test windows throughout the year. So there's only four months out of the year when it's not being offered. So it, it gives you multiple opportunities to see it. You don't have to wait until April or October to take the test anymore. Does and the refresher course offered here, do you go to the website, the NCWS website, and look at the reference material? We, we have them do that and also use uh, uh, an online Okay. Okay. Because you ha you can't take your own reference material now, and I'm, and I'm sure they'll tell you. So to familiarize yourself with the the reference material is advisable before you go take the exam. So. And here's some information on exam administration. Again, the windows that we mentioned it is about six hours for your appointment. And here's some, some statistics on pass rates. These are national pass rates. It's kind of kind of hard to see, but um, this is only for first-time takers for the first few months of this year. Um, 
Civil was 74%, electrical and computer 82%, mechanical 84%. Um, the average in Tennessee was, I think it was 71% uh, for January through August, and Lipscomb's for that period was 92%. So y'all have a very good pass rate here and are to be commended for that. And there is some information, again, on, on NCWS's website and also on YouTube. You can look that up. Um, won't have time to go through all the questions, unfortunately, but we we'll, was we'll trying to make a little time at the end here for some questions. Should take it. If I could go back and talk to myself. Skip that. Yeah. Skipping, skipping. And, of course, we have a PE exam, too, which we won't go into great depth into. Um, that is your final step once you pass that, um, assuming you've completed all your experience. Likely when you're states. eligible, unless you take it early in another state, it might be computer-based by the time you get eligible, yeah. become eligible for NCWS it. NCWS is moving in that direction, um, but right now you can take <coughs> like crates of reference materials into the exam room. Um, it literally crates. That's, that's what people use dollies to bring their materials in. So that's one of the big obstacles to moving towards computer-based testing for the PE. How do we handle reference materials? Two suitcases. All right. I've seen a lot of a lot of books. It just it has to be bound, but, and it's it's offered in 17 different disciplines. You have them on your slide here. Software is the newest one. And here's the big picture. Keep your eye on the target because certainly over four years you could. Life gets in the way, but you need to keep focused on trying to work towards PD licensure. Any other comments? I think we beat it to death, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. I think so, we're preaching to the choir. So what questions do you have? Anything? A lot of this is way more down the road. It's important. The, the thing I hear most from engineers who do not have PEs that are maybe 40 years old is I wish I'd done. I wish I'd done it. There was always a reason that they didn't take the MP or didn't take the PE, and every one of them says, I wish I'd done it. I wish I'd done it differently. So this is really the entire reason we're trying to, to make sure you understand. Okay? And we do have some materials down front here, and we're, we're going to hang around for a little bit afterwards if you want to come up and ask us some questions. Good luck to you.